Good evening. Always great to be back here in Torah Or in Los Angeles. And one of the best lectures I ever gave was here. It went viral and made a lot of ballet tshuva, that, uh, that particular lecture that I had here, and with lots of questions and answers in the end. Baruch Hashem, we wanted to speak a little bit about the purpose of life, but I always like to talk about the, what the audience need, not what the flyers say. So I'm, I'm always uh, evaluating my audience, and based on that I know what to really focus on. As you all know, we are now in very critical days. Critical days because the center of the world, the, the, the most important piece of land in the eyes of Hashem, the creator of the world, obviously is Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. And what's happening over there reflects in the entire world. Reflects everywhere. And in Eretz Israel, there is a cultural war, but it's also a big war between the righteous people to the wicked people. And it's been, in the last, uh, as you saw, many, many elections again and again and again, we cannot actually get a government. Now, finally, the right is one together with the religious people, and they can form a government already a month. It's a big fight of the Satan. The Satan is fighting with, his, with full force to destroy the people of the land of Israel. Destroy everyone. Baruch Hashem, we have to, even after the election, that it's supposed to be a big victory, Baruch Hashem, we now have an opportunity to try to fix things for four years. It's not enough. Because even if you have a good government, and this government will be majority of Shomrei Shabbat for the first time in history. But the, the, the cancer in Israel, the spiritual cancer is so terrible that if you know a little bit about medicine, if you come to a cancer specialist and he says those words, it's stage four, it spreads all over the body, every organ already have it. You know by now you need a super, super miracle from Hashem that a person would survive. Because usually cases like this end terribly, within weeks. This is where we are right now in, in the land of Israel. I wish it was an exaggeration. I wish. I wish I was exaggerating, but I'm not. Because if you look at what happened in the schools in Israel, if you see what the brainwash they did to the children in the last few years, they drove them all crazy. All the children in Israel, they just mamash took away their personality. They convinced all of them that they should be boys, girls should be boys, boys should be girls. It's abomination, horrible thing. Every week they bring another transgender to brainwash the children and another filthy abomination people. And they destroy the mind of the people. Of course, already for 20 years, now one religious person is allowed to ever speak in Israeli schools. It's against the law. No principle will allow ever a person with a beard or yamaka, forget rabbi, even just a religious person to come speak to the kids. Absolutely not. They will never allow it. They will allow an Arab murderer to come from the Hamas. They will allow a Christian missionary, but absolutely they will not let any rabbi come inside and speak. Even Chabad speakers that are very soft to the children, they're not going to speak too strict, they're not going to try to make them, you know, become Shomrei Shabbat. They will come to talk about general topics, they won't let them in. They don't even let them put fill in. If they try to put fill in outside of the school, you have to see what they do. They come, they scream, they curse, they knock down the, 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 the boot. It's hard to believe what's happening here. The hate that the media made to the religion, you need a super, super miracle to save the Israeli secular, even the traditional people, 
from the brainwash they had to go through in the last 10, 20 years. I speak to now a few friends of mine in the government. I was in a Knesset few months, I spoke to them before we won the election, before. It was all hypothetically speaking, when we will win, this is what we have to do. Now it becomes practical. Now I'm going back again next month to Israel. There's a list of more than a hundred urgent things that needs to be done. But every one of them is going to be a world war. Every one of them. To eliminate the Supreme Court, the biggest enemy of the Jewish nation in history. There's nobody hates religion more than them. The Bagats, Shem Reshaim Irkav. Rav Shach, Alav Shalom, 40 years ago, said horrible things about them, and they, today they are a hundred times worse than 40 years ago. So just to show you, he said, we never had nachat from them. Every ruling that they ever made was against the Torah. Here in America, it's not like that. You can go to the Supreme Court, they'll be more objective. Yeah, they're not religious, don't expect so much from these judges, but they don't have prejudice and racism against Judaism. They don't try to be objective according to what they understand. In Israel, there's no chance ever for a religious person to get a fair trial. They are so allergic to religious people. When a judge sees a religious person, it's like the old days, like the German used to see a Jew. That's how it is. That's what they did to them. So once is to eliminate them, that the government will make all the rules when it comes to Jewish ideology and Jewish law. For instance, they want to bring chametz to all the hospitals in Pesach. We don't want chametz in hospitals. I'm going to be in a hospital in Pesach and people will eat bread in my face, in my room. All these uh, lefties going to come in and eat and drink beer and whatever they do over there. Come on, give a little respect to religion. No, yes, you don't tell us what to eat. But it's in the hospital, eat outside, eat in your house. Nobody tells you what to do. No, they made a rule. Hametz will go into their thing. They want to make a reforma. Reform all the kashruyot. That everyone can announce that he's, uh, he's giving kashrut. Anyone. Find some homeless here in Los Angeles. Come, Jimmy. Come here. We want to make you an authority. What? From now on you give kashrut. They want to make everyone wants to convert. People that don't keep Shabbat. They'll be able to convert people. <laughs> he himself is like a goy. How is he going to convert others? He has zero respect for the religion. Everyone who wants to give conversion papers will be legal. Now let me explain to you in case you don't understand what it means. It means that the nation of Israel will be full by hundreds of thousands of new non-Jews, which will marry Jews thinking they are Jewish after a generation, and there will be another million not-Jewish kids in Israel, that one day our children will have to marry them. Your grandchildren will all be goyim. They already did that trick. They brought 960,000 non-Jews from USSR. Almost everyone is a non-Jew. Now they want to extend it to fourth generation, meaning for sure everyone will be not Jewish. This is a destruction of Israel. You won't be, right now already, right now already, every secular Jew in Israel that is younger than 20 is questionable if he's Jewish or not. You have to do a very serious investigation. People that are 50, 60, there's still a chance they're Jews. The young generation, because the country is flooded with so many non-Jews who marry Jews, so now they have children, you don't know who's a Jew and who's not. You're going to have to do Sifrei Yuchasin, like it used to be before the state of Israel, in exile. The rabbis used to have books in every family to know who's a Jew and who's not. And this is the only way to do it. Otherwise, you're going to have to convert hundreds of thousands of Israelis because of the doubt. It's a big problem. They want to accept reform conversions. Reform conversions. I want to explain to you in two minutes what does it mean to be a reform Jew. To be a reform Jew means that you're 99% for sure not Jewish. You are Becheskat Goy. Why? Because they already assimilated 220 years. 
the, the, the reforms in America, as you can see, go check one by one, they all marry non-Jews, almost all of them. And it's not from now, it's the mother and the grandmother and the grand-grandmother already 200 years. So therefore, every person who comes today and tells you I'm a reformed Jew, my name is Leibovitz, my name is Cohen, my name is uh, whatever my name is, is almost for sure an Anjou. Almost for sure. Would you take a 99% risk that your, ch your grandchildren and children will be not Jewish after what we, we've been through for 3,000 years? That's what they want to do. But let me tell you about the biggest risk. Since they will allow anyone, that was the plan. If, this, if the government would lose four more years with his lefties, that's it. It will be the end of Israel officially. Now there's so much to fix because they passed a lot of laws. I'll give you one example. If, according to what they wanted to do, that everyone will come with any papers of conversion, any papers, they have to give them a Israeli citizenship, all the Arabs have to do is to form hundreds of Batei Din all over the Middle East. And any Mustafa and Ahmed will put a stamp. Conversion in Dubai, conversion in Bahrain, conversion in Syria, conversion in Iran, anywhere you want. And they have, by law, they have to accept them as Jews, give them Israeli passport, and they take over Israel in 10 years, all the terrorists. They don't even need to smuggle. They don't need to come and shoot. They don't need to fight. All they have to do is just to walk in. They have tons of money. They come in, they open a bank account, they begin to get money. This week I found out that China has an army inside Israel. Did you know that? They have stations, military stations, with spies and people, Chinese, that came as workers in construction, spies. They are inside Israel and they spying, according to what they say, they're not spying against Israel, they're spying against Chinese that are against China. Just like Iran, have a lot of Iranians who escaped from Iran and they live in Europe. So the Iranian ayatollahs, they send hitmen to kill them. If they embarrass them on, online, all of a sudden you hear this Persian guy, where is he? Disappeared. Either they take them to Iran and torture them to death, or they kill them in Europe. They have thousands of hitmen, the Iranians, just like the CIA, just like the Mossad. They also have, they not, they not only target Jews and synagogue, they target their own people. They kill their own people. Now imagine China, instant. Baruch Hashem, Trump was smart enough to tell Netanyahu not to allow Chinese to buy property in Israel. Because the Chinese came with billions of dollars, started to buy every company. Building, real estate, Tnuva, Tnuva. All the dairy that you buy here in Costco, all the, Jew, the dairy, it's owned by Chinese. They bought Tnuva, one of the biggest companies in Israel. Next thing, they would buy Bezek. Next thing, they would buy military company who make all kinds of things, high-tech companies, and take over Israel. There are so many threats. We need a, a, a super miracle by Hashem. I'm optimistic a little bit just because if Hashem made us this miracle that we finally got rid of these lefties who hates the Torah so much, and we have now a four years opportunity to save the situation, or at least some of it, maybe, there, maybe Hashem after all will not neglect us. But I'm telling you this, Rabotai, if we won't do it now, that's it. It will be, chas v'shalom, a lost case. This is what's going on, Rabotai, right now. I, wanted, I want to explain to you a little bit. The Ramchal, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, he has a lot of books. He only lived 38, 39 years, and he wrote more than 100 books, which almost all of them were gone. We don't have them. The, the two most famous ones are Mesilat Yisharim, Path to the Just, and Derech Hashem, The Way of Hashem. When you read the book Derech Hashem, you know that, yes, the Ramchal wrote it, but you know Akadosh Baruch Hu wrote every word over there. You see right away, it's not. It's not human. The explanations over there about what's happening in this world and the upper world and about the differences between people and angels and demons and the purpose, it's beyond words. 
And I'm Baruch Hashem made a decision, when I go back to New York, I'm going to make a new series. It's been a few years since I made a series. Every one of the series I made became Baruch Hashem classical. Had many, many, many views and made a lot of ballet tshuva. We did Mispat to the Jazz, we did Pirkei Avot. I did the entire Taryag Mitzvot, 613 commandments. I did the, the, the a series about the entire Talmud, all the Agadetot of the Talmud, and Yaakov cover all the Masachtot. I did the psychology of the mind of the soul, and I did another series of the psychology of the mind about dating and relationships, two different series. And Bezrat Hashem now, I'm going to make that series, Derech Hashem. I started today to plan it in my mind. In the book Derech Hashem, the Ramchal explained about the difference between people and all the other creatures that Hashem made. If somebody asks you now, what is the difference between a human being to an animal? Give me the, give me the difference. We, the DNA is very similar. We all, we all have bodies. Both of us attracted to physical pleasure. Both of us have desires. Both of us are created male and female. Both of us can die and never move after that. There's a lot of similarity between people. For instance, a man and a, co and a monkey, it's 99% the same. Just the monkey is a little bit hairier, more hair, and he's bending down when he walks. He cannot stand straight. But other than that, there's a lot of similarity. The organs, the body, the fingers, the toes, very similar. So the question is, why Hashem made people and he made monkeys? Obviously, it confused the scientists a lot. They, they think that we came from the monkeys. Obviously, it's nonsense. But we understand at least where the idea came from. So the question is now, can you tell me, please, according to the Torah, what is the difference between a person and an animal? Who thinks he knows the answer? It sounds like a simple un uh, question, but it's a complicated question. Who knows the, the difference? Yeah. Say the Chacham, choosing, choice. Correct or incorrect? That's the usual answer that everybody gives. But it's incorrect. Why it's incorrect? Put in front of your dog kebab and chicken. It's going to smell. Today it's going to eat kebab. The next week it's going to eat the chicken. It's choosing. Today is in the mood for this. Tomorrow is in the mood for that. Give him two females. He looks at them. He's attracted to her more than her. Yeah? Take her away, bring somebody else, he changes his mind, he'll go to the first one. Because now, you know, so he's making choices. Very similar to a secular Jew. He has desires, he sees what he likes, what's going to bring him more pleasure, and he goes after that. So what's the difference? Go in and... Same thing. What is the difference between people and animals? There are two main differences. First one is that people are the only species among two million creatures that Hashem made that we know. There's probably much more. So far we have two million names of animals. And they're all male and female. Right? So we know already the agenda, we know the plan of the Creator, that the species will continue to multiply. There is no room for homosexuality in nature. This is a major crime against the Creator. And you don't have to be religious to understand that. It's simple common sense. So two million species, and we have two unique things about us that the animals do not have. One, we are the only species that can choose to do against our will. The animals cannot do it. Animals live by instinct. They have preferences, and they will always go by their preferences. They like this more than this, they'll eat that. 
If they like this particular food more than that, they will always go for that. If they see water, they'll jump in. That's always going to be the case. A person also has preferences, also would like to do ABC. But he is the only one that will be very attracted to do something and will be able to do the opposite of what he's interested to do. This you will never find by the animals. Meaning a Jew, he could not find a girl to get married. The years are passing. He saw a very pretty non-Jew. Rich, nice, kind, good heart, loving the Jews. A perfect girl. There's only one problem. Hashem say in the Torah, you're not allowed. You have to stay only among the, your own nation, the chosen people. What's his choice? He would take her in a minute and will be so happy about it. Wow, the deal of my life. Now the Torah say, you do it, you pay a very big price, Habibi. There are consequences to your actions. You're going to see what's going to happen. Your children won't be Jewish. You cut your genealogy. Later when you come in front of me, I will treat you as a traitor. You betray me. Person understand. And he said to her, very nice. I wish you good luck. Go back to your parents. I can't marry you. It's not in my hand. You cannot find an animal to do such thing. If an animal is attracted to something, that's it. You can come to the, to the lion that wants to eat the zebra and is coming closer and closer. You say to him, excuse me, Mr. Lion, we want to take a few pictures. We didn't finish. Can you wait 15 minutes? Then you, then you can have the zebra as much as you want. <laughs> He's hungry now. There's no way to stop him. Why? Because he cannot choose against what he has a desire for. The only species that can overcome his desire and will is the person. That he feels that's the wrong thing to do. He wants to embarrass someone and he holds himself. An animal cannot. If an animal wants to retaliate, it must retaliate. What is the second difference? Animals, whatever they think, whatever they say in their language, and whatever they do, stay only in this world. It does not reflect on a spiritual, upper, divine world at all. The, the people, every transaction of their life, whether they think something good or bad, or they say something good or bad, or they do something good and bad, they send like a message, like a, like a, like a laser. They send a package that goes up to the spiritual world, get recorded, and immediately reflects back into this world. It's a two-way street. Every thought of a Jew affects the upper world, for good or for bad. If he thinks filthy, it makes a damage. It goes up, it gets recorded, and immediately reflect, reflect on the entire Jewish nation. He speaks good words, words of Torah, words of ethics. It goes up and makes an impact, and it reflects back to the world. To the point that a transaction of a Jew can make tomorrow rain in Israel, or can prevent the rain for a week. Remember, the rest of the world, it's programmed by the laws of nature. Every once in a while, you're going to have rain, it's routine. In the land of Israel, there's a different story. That's already the house of Hashem. Every transaction over there makes a much bigger impact on the world than when you do it in America or in other places in the world. To the point that the Ramchal writes that if a person commits a sin, it's not only affecting his soul and his nefesh, it's not only reflecting to the spiritual world and returning back as a boomerang to hurt us, it affects all the material around the area of his sins. For instance, if you buy a piece of furniture from a Buddhist 
or Hindu, or one of the other idol worshippers. And they actually worship their idol on that table. They put their the Buddha on it, and everybody would come and dance and sing and bow down to it. You don't see a difference on the table. It still looks nice, mahogany, expensive table. Now they close that temple, the, the idol worshippers, and they put it for sale. And you go and you buy it. You know, use furniture. You pay $1,000, you buy it. You put it in your house, it can destroy your life. Destroy your children, destroy your life, destroy the food you eat. It's affected in such a negative way because of the idol worshipping that the goyim are not allowed to worship idol. So it's a big crime for the goyim with the death penalty. When the goyim constantly do it, it brings tragedies to the world, but it affects all the material around. Or the other way around. If you get the table of Rav Ovadia Yosef, you know the table that he has in his room? He learned, I don't know, 50, 60, 7 years on that table. From day one, he moved to Arnof. That table, that particular table. There's so much Torah and so much writing of Sfarim on that book, on that, on that table, that if you go and buy this place and make it your room inside your house, it's affecting your neshama just being around it in a positive way. The Ramchal writes about it and it's been proven scientifically. Proven. You know what scientific proof? You can argue about it. I give you two proofs for that. There's one Japanese doctor in Japan that wanted to see the influence of people's speech on material. Where the goy, the Japanese goy, got the idea to test the effect of people's actions and speech on raw material, to begin with, it's fascinating. How would they go even think about such an idea? But obviously not that many goyim had this idea besides that Japanese one. But he became very famous. He has a patent. So what did he do? He took drops of waters, drops of waters, and he put them in a little, uh, you know, little glass bottles, and he put them in a negative 274 degrees. Very, very cold. Okay. Complete ice. And in one room, he put 10 Japanese people to curse all day next to this water. They're cursing in Japanese. Cursing all day. Pay the money. It's an experiment. So all day they curse and speak bad words of hate. Then he took the same water frozen water in another room that all the Japanese spoke about nice words, about love, loving each other, positive words, they read. And then he checked with the microscope how the water looked in the first room and how the water looked in the second room. He took pictures, breathtaking, shocking. In the room that the Japanese go in cursed all day, you look at the, with the microscope, you see nothing. Everything smeared, no symmetric, no shape, no nothing. Just like this, scrambled, smeared everywhere. In a room that they spoke positive words, you look with the microscope, every one of the drops look like an unbelievable diamond. Cut up symmetrically, shapes of triangles, rounds, equal, unbelievable, like just like a diamond cutter works for a month to make a diamond that you pay 20, 30,000 for. You look with the microscope, you get the shock of your life. The effect of the speech of this goyim designed the water to be in unbelievable shape without touching it physically. Nobody touched the water. The water was frozen right there in the room. Based on this research, an Israeli student from Universita Barilan, his name is Tomer Raviav. That's, that's his name, Tomer Raviav. Tomer, it's a famous name in Israel. He decided to do a similar experiment and he has a patent on it. He took beans, shuit, what we put in a chulent. He took cartons, spear cartons, put water on the curtains, and put those beans on the curtains. 
He put them in one room and he took 10 guys to curse all day in Hebrew. Put them in a room all day cursing each other. Getting paid for it. <laughs> then he took another room. He's religious, this uh, Tomer, from the university. To read Tehillim next to the beans all day. For three weeks or two weeks. You have to see the research. It's famous research. You can find it online in Hebrew. For two or three weeks, people read Tehillim next to it. And in the other room, everybody cares all day. In the room they cares, nothing grew. It all fell to the side. Every, it mamash collapsed everything. Nothing grew. In a room that they read Tehillim, all those beans grew up to two feet. Straight, nice, with leaves. Mamash like a tree. This is the room with the blessing and the Tehillim, reading Psalms all day, Tehillim, and this is the room cursing all day. Look how it's affecting material. It, if, if it affects raw material like this, imagine how much it affects our divine soul. Now I want to ask you a question. Did God create something bad in the world or no? Or He only created good? Light and darkness. Light, we say Yotzer Or. Hashem designed the light, made sun, and the sun gives us light. When it comes to Choshech, what do we say? We don't say Yotzer Choshech. Bore. So what was first? Choshech, darkness. It was darkness. Once Hashem created the light, the light eliminates the darkness. Once the light enters the room, you don't feel the darkness. The darkness still exists there. Same darkness that was before. The light has the ability to overcome the darkness. But the darkness was first. So in the beginning of the creation, it was all darkness. And then, how was the light? It was a spiritual light. Aor Aganuz, we call it. Until the fourth day, it was a divine light, like Trentgen, like MRI. It goes through items. It can penetrate, it can see from the other side of the wall. Special spiritual light. The Kabbalah explained that Hashem took away that light and hid it for the future to come to the righteous people. Right now, the world does not deserve to have such a light after the sin of Adam. So instead of this light, he gave us a replacement. Which light? The light of the sun that was hung in the, in the fourth day. By Yom HaRavi'i, the Meorot HaGdolim. So Hashem hung the sun and the sun gives us a light. The sun. Is it something spiritual or something physical? Physical. Not so simple. Right away, the first thing comes to the mind is physical. Fire. Fire is physical. The temperature in the sun is 15 million degrees Celsius in the center of the sun. The sun is a thousand times bigger than the earth. So when you go from the center of the sun to the edge of the sun, imagine an orange, right? In the middle of the orange inside, the temperature is 15 million, which is 20 million American degrees Fahrenheit. 20 millions. We die from 100 degrees here. Sweat. This is 20, 20 million. When you travel from the center of the sun towards the end, once you get to the peel, the sun has a peel, just like an orange. Inside the orange, you have a white color, the peel. Outside, an orange or green, right? The white color, the temperature drops to 2 million degrees. Outside of the peel, it drops to 6,000 degrees, 35 times less. Meaning this peel observes all the radiation to prevent it from burning all the worlds and all the stars around. So Hashem designed the sun in such a place with the right distance all the way to the earth with a thick peel that 
absorb all the radiation that by the time the light comes to here, it will be 30 degrees Celsius in average, which is about 90, 80, 70. That's what we get here. Otherwise, you cannot live. You don't have to be a genius to understand that if you take the Earth, which is a tiny ball compared to the Sun, it's nothing, it's like a dot. If, and space is endless, space. It's endless. You can travel for millions of years, you, you're not going to finish. If you had enough gas in your spaceship, you keep going and going in any speed. You're just going to go forever. You're never going to hit a wall or the space will not end. Some scientists claim that the shape of the space is like the, le the, the number eight. That's why if you continue to travel, you're actually going in such a shape of an eight, that's why it will never end. Because imagine you have an highway shape of an eight, you're going to go forever. It's never going to be an end to it, but in, re in reality you go around the same place. Top. It's possible, it's logical. But one thing we do know, since the space is so huge, we had unlimited amount of options for Hashem where to create, uh, where to place our world. Here, 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 here. Trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of options. Here, 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 here. Imagine, you can place anywhere. Anyway, imagine an ocean. You have a huge ocean and you have a little coin. One shekel, tiny. And you have to decide where to place it in the ocean, here or here or here. How many options do you have? Trillions of options. That's not even the beginning of space. Now imagine if I come and say to you, Rabotai, the entire ocean, which is 72% of the world, this shekel can be placed only in one area, not two. There's not two options. There's only one place that the shekel must be placed. Because anywhere else, you cannot have life. You need to place the world in only one place, in endless space, in one place that people will not burn from the sun or will not freeze. If it will be a little bit too close, we will burn in a second. If it will be a little bit far, we will freeze in a second. Isn't it unbelievable that the only place that the earth was placed is the only place that we can have life? And then you have scientists that are so full, foolish, such fools that they say, ah, it was all made by explosions, many explosions, everything got together by itself. I mean, okay, normal. How can you even listen to such a normal person when he hears such nonsense, his ear should fall off. So going back to what I say. So Hashem created darkness and now we have the light that actually overcome the darkness. But I ask a better question. Did Hashem create anything bad? What do you think? By the way, you may say cancer is bad, bankruptcy is bad, barrenness is bad, not to have children, or you marry 40 years and no kids, that's bad. Depression is bad, uh, physical pain is bad, root canals is bad. I can give you a list of millions of things that we define as bad. But obviously, if I ask you such a question, I'm sure you're clever enough to understand that I already knew about all these bad things. So if I still ask this question, that means the answer is deeper. Oh. So the, the answer the Ramchal explained that there's really no bad coming from Hashem. So how come we have so much suffering in this world? Do you know one person in the world that doesn't suffer? I still did not meet that person. Every person I met in my life suffered. Some more, some less, obviously. Some suffer to points that they, <laughs> they're suicide already. They want to commit suicide. Some suffer, but you know, they're on and off. Suffer, comes and goes. You know, some suffer from health, some from their children, some from their marriage, some from their financials. 
some from the government, some from problems with their brain. There's a lot of problems. The Ramchal explained that all this negative that we see, all this supposedly bad, is when Hashem take away the good. Meaning, this bad is when Hashem take away his light from a person. When a person behave according to the rules of the Torah, follow the Torah and the mitzvot, learn Torah, pray, avoid from, from committing all kinds of sins, the more he follows the Torah, the more righteous he is, the more he fixes midot, his personality, his traits, the more light, spiritual light of Hashem goes into his life. How is it done? There are unlimited amount of stairs, levels. What is it like? You have a pyramid. And in the top of the pyramid, you have a huge projector, round projector, like a circle, which sends a lot of light downstairs, like this, towards down. When you all the way in the bottom, you barely get affected by this light. If you want to read a book, you cannot see. You see very little because you, you, there's a thousand stairs to go. Every step you go higher, you get closer to the light. Life becomes better. You are happier. You read better. You enjoy better. This is just an analogy. It's a parable. But when it comes to the, sh to the soul, it's a divine light or a loki. So the more you elevate yourself, the more the light of Hashem goes on your neshama. The more your neshama is enlightened by Hashem, the better it reacts. You learn more Torah, you understand more Torah, you're able to teach, you have siyata dishmaya, you fix yourself even more, and more light comes, and you get better, it's a two-way street. You go higher and more light. You go higher and more light. But there is obstacles also. That's the Satan, the Yetzirah, all the negative things that always try to pull us down. When a person surrenders to his desire and commits a bad sin, immediately is going a few steps lower, meaning darkness starting to go into his life. Spiritual darkness, not physical. When I asked before if the sun is spiritual or physical, immediately you answer physical. But it's not so simple. I'll tell you why. In order for us to move an object in nature, what do we need? To push. Anything you want to push forward, what do you need? You need energy. Energy. Either you push it with your hands, you have energy. Your body creates energy. Or you light fire, it creates gas, and it pushes items like airplanes, like cars, it pushes them away. Air goes out of the muffler, and it pushes the car away. So, m missiles, rockets, bullets, it's all energy. Dynamites burn, and it flies. That's the law of physics. The light of the sun is sent from billions of miles away until it gets to us. It's already 5,783 years since Hashem put it there. Almost 6,000 years. First question is how the fire inside the sun was never reduced even by 1%. It's always remained the same. Where, what does it burn? In order for you to make fire, you need wood. You need a lot of wood. If you want to increase the fire or maintain it, you have to keep putting more either papers or wood or something that the fire can eat. But the sun does not have anything inside that helps it to burn. It burns against the law of nature. Law of nature say you need, fire needs something to eat in order for it to exist. By the sun, it exists without any food. That's unbelievable. But it gets better. What's the speed of light? 
300,000 kilometer per second. Do you know what it means? From here to, let's say you drive 100 miles an hour. And 100 miles an hour on a highway. After an hour, you moved 100 miles, which is about 60 kilometer. 60, 61 kilometer. That's 60. How long did it take you? One hour, if you drive with a Ferrari, right? 100 miles an hour. In one hour, you moved 60 miles, which is 100 kilometer. The question that I have now, 300,000 kilometer, it's almost 200,000 miles, almost. Almost 200,000 miles. So if it's uh, only, if, if it's 300,000 uh, kilometer per second, that means that in one second, one second, the do 300,000 kilometer multiply, I mean divided by 100 kilometer. How much it gives you? 300,000, 30,000, 3,000. That means what you do in one hour, 3,000 hours on a highway, that's what the light travel in one second. You, you with me or no? You are 30 hours on the highway driving 62 miles per hour. 30 hours. This is what the light move in one second. So by the time it gets from the sun to us, it's a matter of seconds or minutes. Now here, here comes the catch. If I send light from here to the other side of the room, the light will go past the wall or no? From the other side, you would see the light? No. I have a projector. I shoot it there on the wall. Someone on the other side of the wall, the next room, doesn't see anything. He's still in the darkness. What stopped my light? The wall. The more dark is the wall, the more it will stop the light. The more light it is, there is a chance that the light will go through. If it's clear, the light will go through. If it's light, white color, some of the light can go in. But if it's completely black and this, it blocks the entire light. Now here comes the problem. When the lights hit the surface, the speed of the light slow down tremendously, almost to zero. Just like you stop a ball. But when the light penetrates and go to the other side, the light accelerates by itself back to 300,000 kilometer per second. Let me explain to you what I'm talking about. I take a tennis ball now, and I throw it to my friend who stands on the other side of the room in a very fast speed. My friend is going to put his hand, hit the ball. The ball is going to fall on the floor and go from 100 miles an hour to one or two miles an hour, right? It will fall on the floor until it would stop. Imagine after my friend stopped the, the ball, the ball pen gets up from the floor by itself and begin to shoot again to the same speed with no energy to 300,000 kilometer per second. Who told the light always to go back to 300,000 miles per second? Always. It has to be the speed. That's the way Hashem designed the world. But how does the light know? Why it doesn't go to 400, 500? Why it doesn't stop at 100,000 kilometers per second? How does it know always to go to the same speed? From here we see that the light of the sun, the sun is physical. But the light of the sun is not so simple. Because nothing in physics accelerates by itself without energy. There's no such thing. And even if you use energy to make an acceleration, it's very hard to control the speed to be always the same exact speed. Impossible. So from here we see that even the light of the sun, it's partially spiritual. The Ramchal continue. 
The Ramcha, from what we see so far, we understand how horrible it is to commit sins. In Judaism, we have an expression, it's called Tshuvat HaMishkal. When you repent, you do Tshuva, most of the people do Tshuva in general. They used to be Mechalel Shabbat, now they become Shomer Shabbat. They have to regret that they were Mechalel Shabbat, they have to be ashamed, they have to ask Hashem every day when they daven, Hashemnu, Bagadnu, the whole list. Then comes Yom Kippur. So they repent on Yom Kippur, fast, ask for mechilat, yagmidot, slichot. And because it's a sin that has a punishment of karet, there are 36 sins in the Torah, that the punishment for them is, v'nichreta nefesh ha'id, HaKash Baruch Hu Chas V'Shalom will cut that soul out of the eternity, the eternal life. So in order for a person to reconnect himself to life of eternity, the way Hashem made it, that he has to go through suffering, physical suffering. The physical suffering, it's like welding two metals together. They broke, you have to put them back together to be one piece, it has to be through suffering, to burn it. So a person has to suffer. One great thing about it is you don't have to chas v'shalom get cancer or to lose money or to be, in general, to suffer pain, or, you know, to have uh, abuse. It doesn't have to be this kind of suffering. What kind of suffering you can choose? I'll give you an example. In Rosh Hashanah, Hashem decide, this Jew, Reuven, Baruch Hashem became Shomer Shabbat. He's ashamed that he was Mechalel Shabbat for 20 years. He regrets. He asked Mechila every day, he confessed, few Yom Kippur passed, but he has to get suffering. But I don't want to give Reuven suffering. Why? Instead of waking up every morning at 8 and go to the shul at 8.30, which he has all the time in the world to do, because he starts his business at 10, 10 30. what's the rush? Well, Daven from 8.30 to 9.30, eat breakfast and go to work. Why do I have to wake up and pray at 6 or 6.30? Why? I do it for the sake of heaven, to, to daven and sunrise, it's the highest level. If a person does it, the suffering of getting out of bed, or the freezing weather when he leaves at six, it's much colder than eight, and he has the wind in his face, and it's raining sometimes. The physical suffering in keeping the mitzvot, or learning Torah, or doing chesed to other, Hashem takes it, and replace the cancer, or the money lost, or the suffering that in Rosh Hashanah Hashem prepared for that person, and replace it with the spiritual suffering that a person brings on himself. For instance, a person wants to buy tefillin. You can find tefillin for thousand dollars, you can find tefillin for five thousand dollars. If he will buy the thousand dollars, it will be ordinary pair, nothing special, with machines, electric, shortcuts. It took a lot less to make, time. And he's not such a rich person. Let's say he work all week and he make a thousand dollars a week. If he will buy tefillin for a thousand dollars, it's one week of hard work. Six days he work to have one pair of tefillin. If he buy the five thousand pair, that's five weeks of hard work. The extra four weeks that he put in to get something special with no electric, all handmade, with the best so fair, in a very, it's a, one of the three agreements with Hashem, Tfilin. Shabbat, Brit, Tfilin. Shabbat, Shin, Bet, Taf. Shin, Shabbat, Bet, Brit, Taf, Tfilin. It's an important mitzvah. The extra four weeks that he worked to get a better level takes away from his sicknesses and from other money losses or Chas V'Shalom Ayares that was supposed to audit him, or other things. Why? Because that was the plan. You need to erase all the Chilulei Shabbat, you need to erase the Avodah Zarah, you need to erase Chametz, chametz Bepesach, you need to erase homosexuality, you need to erase sex crimes, you need to erase all kinds of sins, 36 of them, that the punishment for them is disconnection of the soul from Hashem, from the afterlife. You want to reconnect, you must go through struggle. Just like when you want to save a person's life, you open the chest, you have to cut, 
It's a lot of suffering, he has to be in bed for six months, he loses a lot of money, he's very weak, he causes other problems. Why? That's the way to save life, with pain. Nobody thinks to blame the doctor. When you go to the dentist and you jump 20 times on a chair, right? The dentist gives you a shot, already you jump. Then he begins to drill, you jump. Give you another shot, you jump. The dentist is torturing you or is saving you? Depends what dentist. If he's a dentist that is a tzaddik, Yere Shamaim, he will only perform on you what you really need. Unfortunately, most of them are not Yere Shamaim, so they create problems. Someone testified to me once that he worked in 20 different places for 12 years. By this office, by that office. And every place he went, Baruch Hashem, they were all not Jewish. But they all told him, the insurance cover up to 2,500, use it. Use it. But he doesn't have anything, he has one little cavity. What is it, 100, 200 hours? Find what to do. Do this, do that, root canal, cleaning. Find what to do. That's, uh, that's a scam. That's called insurance fraud. Someone that steals money from the goyim, it's a sin from the Torah, worse than eating pork. Worse than eating pork. You come to that dentist, you tell him, here, eat pork. Huh? You're crazy? I eat pork, I'm a Shomer Shabbat. I'm not gonna eat pork. I'll give you $5,000, eat the pork. Ah, you're insulting me. I'll sell Hashem for $5,000. You do it every day in your office. Hundreds of times a week. Why do you worry about the pork? That's much worse. It's also Chilul Hashem. If one day they'll find out and it's going to be all over, all over the news and an article in the New York Times, look at the Jew, what he's doing. <laughs> it's going to be a disaster. Same thing in real estate, same thing mechanics, same thing moving companies. A part of being a tzaddik, Mi Ha'ale Be'ar Hashem, Neki Kapayim Ubar Levav. There's a lot of halachot. For instance, someone stole money from you. What do you do normally? What, a, what normally a Jew does when someone stole money from him? Take him to court. He takes him to court. A Jew allowed to take another Jew to court? Not allowed, it's a horrible crime. Let's say someone stole from you $100,000. Legit. He's the thief, not you, you're the victim. You sue him in a court of Los Angeles. They check the evidence, they check the contract, they see the checks that you gave him. Everything is legit. The judge rule that he has to pay you 100,000 with some penalty and interest, let's say 110,000 after a year. That's usually what happens. So that crook is afraid of the, of the judge, that's going to be a lien on his business or whatever. He pays you 110. There's two, two scenes over here. One is Gezel, and second is interest. Interest is lo kam betchiat ametim. If you're supposed to resurrect in the resurrection of the dead, you don't resurrect. Why? You charge Jews interest. Not allowed. Unless they are mechalel Shabbat. Because a Jew that is mechalel Shabbat in Shulchan Aruch count 100% like a non-Jew, and the Torah says, ve'la goi tashich. You're allowed to charge interest from goyim. You're allowed to pay interest to Goim. You're allowed to charge interest from Goim. And someone who's not Shomer Shabbat, in Halakha, count like, like Goy. So if you charge him interest, you're lucky that because he's not Shomer Shabbat, you're not going to lose your eternity. If he was Shomer Shabbat, Allah Alecha, you're done. So that's an example. Second problem is, the, the goy, the judge, or even a Jew in a court that ruled you to get 100,000. Let's see, say, I don't want the interest. Keep the 10,000, just give me what I gave you. And he gives you now 100,000. Did you do something wrong or no? Yes. It counts like you stole from him $100,000. It's gezel. Why? If I would go to bed din, with my evidence, the Bedin will also rule that he has to give me the 100,000. Yes, but he didn't go to Bedin. He went to Erkaot of Goim or Chilonim. 
That's 100% gazel. Even your money that he stole, you took it out of him by a court, is count like gazel. And if there was interest, you also charge like you charge interest, if you Shomer Shabbat. If it's Mechalel Shabbat, you got away with the interest at least. But it's still a gazel. This is an example of how many religious Jews fell into this trap. So what do you have to do? You have to go to bed in, and the Bedin sends him an invitation, and most of them won't come, especially the secular ones. He won't come to Bedin. And then the Bedin authorizes you to sue him in a secular court. You did not break any rule. Same thing you did, just took you another month. The procedure to send him invitation to come, he ignored, they send him another one, he ignored. In the end, they gave you permission to take him to court, and now it's all legit. He brought it on himself. There are so many halachot, so many people are falling because of ignorance, and that's the purpose of life. The more knowledge a person gain, the less wicked he become. I'll give you an example. Which person has it easier to fight his evil inclination? Someone that learns a lot of Torah or someone that doesn't learn Torah at all? You have two guys, two Jews. Avram and Yitzchak. Avram all day in Bet Midrash, all day learn Gemara, learn Musar, learn Halacha. This guy Yitzchak, nothing. All day what sport, news, that's it. Both of them have a non-kosher middle, fun of them, and they're both very hungry. If you have to put your money on which one of them will fall faster to eat the non-kosher meat, would you put it on Avram or would you put it on Yitzchak? Let's be objective. What do you think? You put it on the guy who sits and learns Torah all day or the guy who doesn't learn at all? Which one of them will eat the meat faster? They're both hungry. What do you think? I would put all my money without any hesitation that the guy that learns Torah, there is much less of a chance. Everything is possible. But there's much lower chance that he will eat not kosher meat. You may ask, what's the connection between learning Gemara to not eating uh, non-kosher meat? What's the connection? He learns Gemara about a woman's uh, mikveh. What does it have to do with the meat now? Just now you understand the laws of mikvaot. How is it going to save you from not eating non-kosher meat? Do you understand the question or not? If you learn Gemara, Masechet Chulin, Shechitot, and they show you which knife makes the Behemah Taref, and it's like eating Nevela, okay, it's fresh in your mind. You just learn it today in a Kolel, in a Yeshiva. You don't have today the guts to touch meat that you don't know for sure that it's Chalak Bet Yosef. This makes sense. But what if I learn Shnaim Ochazim Betalit, or Shor Shenagach Tapara, or Elu Metziot, or whatever, all these sugiot in Shas, how is it going to help me not to eat not kasher in a restaurant? Good question or no? Yes, but the answer is even better. Remember what the Ramchal just told us? When you do what Hashem told you to do, and there's no bigger mitzvah than learning Torah. Limud Torah can negate kulam. What you gain by learning Torah is a huge progress up the stairs. When you do a mitzvah, you go one step up. When you learn Torah, you can go 500 steps in one minute. And another thousand steps. And another thousand. It's unlimited amount of steps. So you get closer and closer and closer to the divine light. So the more Torah you learn, the more light reflects on your neshama. When the divine light goes into your neshama, you have a lot of power not to break the commitments to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That doesn't have to be the same subject in everything. If you're still not convinced, I'll give you a proof. Go all over the world. I travel a lot. I have to go to a lot of synagogues to pray. One time I'm here in Shachrit, the next week I'm there. Mincha, I'm here, next time I'm there. 
So I always pray where I'm in the area. Sometimes it's yeshiva there. Beautiful. I come to yeshiva or kolel. I pray with them. Sometimes I go to a place of modern people. Bale asakim. Business people. Working people. All over the world. Not only in Los Angeles or in America. Every country. I already know and I will sign on it before I even go there guarantee and I put all my money on it. Be, when I ask my host, where are we going to pray? He tell me in a kolel. I already know what to expect. If he tell me in this shtibel, that only working people coming quickly and rushing to work, I already know what to expect. The davening by a place of Bnei Torah, there's nothing to compare between the way they pray, the way they dress, and how serious they are to a place of modern people who just come because they have to come and they want to go right back of making money and go back with their modern lifestyle. Nothing to compare. Now you may think, okay, maybe they learn about the, the importance of tefillah, the Bnei Torah, so they know how much it's important to Hashem when you dress nice, you come, you know. But these modernim, they don't learn, so they didn't know. So it's lack of knowledge. That's also true. But that's not the main reason. The main reason is that the Bnei Torah get tons of divine light on their neshama. So they have the power to destroy their Yetzirah. Destroy the Yetzirah. Meaning the Yetzirah will always tell you, don't pray. Why, do you so, why so long? Why you have to stand 10 minutes, Shmona Yisrael? Three and a half minutes, it's enough. Why you have to have such a broken heart when you pray? Enough! Why are you such a chassid? In this generation you don't need to be so fanatic. Why you have to pray so early? One uh, doctor, moderny, modern orthodox, he goes to shul in a modern place. Everyone's business people, lawyers, doctors. One chassid came in. Not educated, didn't go to universities, not a doctor, not a lawyer, not... The Hasid, in the middle of davening, begin to scream. Hashem, pash, clapping, clapping, like this, moving. Everybody over there is very quiet. Be barely hear a word in the whole davening. One hour, you barely hear the chazan. So everyone is, you know, very, very quiet. This Hasid makes noise. So the doctor next to him says, excuse me, can you lower your voice? You're distracting my intention in the, in the prayers. The Hasid decided to teach this doctor a little lesson. He took his hand and gave him such a smack, boom, to his face. The doctor was shocked. He screamed, I, loud. Everyone turned around in the shul. The Hasid said to the doctor, why did you scream? What do you mean? You hurt me. He said, you see, when it hurts, you scream. I come to pray to Hashem, I have so many problems. I have so many things to cry for. So I scream. You, Baruch Hashem, have millions, money coming to your accounts every day, thousands of dollars. You know, I have nothing to worry about. Of course you don't scream. You come, you read like you read newspaper. Not even one temperature your body rise in the middle of davening. Not one second you shake. Not one minute of a broken heart in 20 years. I fight for my life. Fight for my children's life. Fight for the rent in two days. I may be on the street in the freezing weather of New York. I fight for my life. I scream. When it hurts, you scream. When it doesn't hurt, you're like a robot. That's why they say if you want to have shliach tzibur, find a poor one, not a multi-millionaire. This guy has billions of dollars. He's going to pray with a broken heart. He just won't hope that it's going to finish because he has an important meeting soon. But the poor is mamash screaming from the bottom of his heart. It doesn't have to be loud. But he screams from his heart. It reminds me of a good joke. One, uh, one girl met an Israeli guy. He's not educated. He works in a falafel store. 
selling falafel. She said to him, listen, I would like to bring you to my parents to introduce you to my parents, Aval, you're not educated. My father is a professor, my mother is a doctor. If they find out you work in a falafel shop, they will put an X on our dating. So I would like you for the time being, tell them that you are in medical school. <laughs> and you're going to finish in one year. Like this, they won't put pressure on me to break up with you. He said, okay. So he comes, so what do you do? You know how in America the first question is always, what do you do? I'm in medical school. She prepared him in advance. Which medical school? She gives him a name. He gives them a name. Tov, impressive. My daughter, Baruch Hashem, is a nice guy. Tov, a few days later, the father passed by the falafel. <laughs> he felt like maybe he's going to get a few kadurim. You know what's kadurim? Kadurim in Hebrew has a lot of meanings. One, kadur means a ball. Kadur means a ball. Kadur also means a bullet of a gun. Kadur also means pills. Advil, those pills. So kadurim, usually, it has few different meanings. Tov. So the father comes to the falafel, <laughs> he sees the doctor. He said, ten li vakasha teisha kadure falafel. Give me please nine balls of falafel without the pita. So he took a cup, he put nine balls of falafel inside, he gave it to him. He said, doctor, huh? He said, absolutely, yes. Take three kadurim baboker, three kadurim batsoraim, three kadurim baerev. <laughs> Take three pills in the morning, three in the afternoon. Doctor, yeah. Anyway, Rabotai, before we finished, just conclude this sugya in Ramchal. The Ramchal said that the way to reflect the divine light on yourself is to gain knowledge. But not just knowledge. If you gain knowledge in math, it doesn't bring any divine light on you. If you, do, if you learn history, there's no light. You learn geography, no light. You learn about sport, you learn economy. What light? Nothing. When you learn Torah, written or oral Torah, it begins to reflect the divine light on your neshama, on your soul. A lot. So the Ramchal says, so what is the purpose of life? To learn as much as possible Torah. The more you learn Torah, the less you're going to do stupid things. You see, big rabbis, they don't behave like animals. They don't, they don't walk on the street with falafel and the trina is all over their face on the street. Did you ever see Rav Ovadia, Rav Kanievsky sitting eating falafel in a shawarma place? It will never happen. They won't eat in front of people. They will always dress in a nice way. If somebody wants to take a picture of them, they'll put their hat on. Every minute of their life is calculated. They don't just do things randomly. It's a call be'ashgacha every second. Full discipline. But children, in the beginning, they do a lot of stupid things. The Ben Ishchai say, up to six years old, you count like a monkey. Monkeys do stupid things, make faces, make noises, jump, flip-flop. Monkey. Kids stand on a table and jump. Take off his clothes in the middle of a street. He doesn't understand. The older he gets, the more knowledge of Torah goes into his system. So every year of Torah that the child learns, you're going to see how he mature and he does less and less stupid things. So what do we learn from here? That the formula to become a tzaddik must be through learning. There's no other ways. Torah and mitzvot. Irat Shamay. Torah and mitzvot. When you learn Torah, it melts the Yetzer Hara. I love to tell that story. So many times I told that story, but it worked to hear it a thousand times. I used to give lectures 
just after September 11. Remember the twins? I used to speak only in Hebrew until September 11. Actually, I, the reason I speak today in English for so many years, it's September 11. Thanks to Bin Laden. Bin Laden attacked New York and all the Israelis of New York escaped from New York. To where? To Los Angeles and Florida and back to Israel. Because the immigration was searching for illegal immigrants after September 11 for a month or two like crazy. Walking, knocking on people's door. And they put a lot of people in New Jersey in a camp. I used to get from people messages that they give them a shower with a horse. Like, so, like horses. There's no showers, they just lock them in a camp. You want to take a shower? With a horse. Take off your clothes, we wash you with a horse. This is how bad it was. So immediately a lot of illegal Israelis who used to work, locksmith, moving, real estate, they all ran away. All of a sudden, from full house, I see less and less people coming to the lecture. I get a phone call, a guy, would you like to come speak in an organization called Or Natan in Queens, in English? I say to myself, maybe it's Mishamayim, the Hebrew is dying out. Maybe I start giving lectures in English. But it's not my original language to give a lecture and it's recorded. It's a lot of embarrassment. You make mistakes. I say, you know what? Let me try. Let's see how it's going to go. I went. I started to give a lecture in this organization. Baruch Hashem first lecture was a house that was turned into a shul. 60 people, full house. 60 seat, all of them were people waited and some people couldn't come in, there was no room. I, they say, want to do it next week again? It was very nice. I say, yeah, why not? I came again, again it's full. Baruch Hashem, I started to give lectures there every week. The Georgians in Queens, they saw that I speak by the Bukharians. Can you come give by us a lecture? Yes, every Wednesday I come to you. It started to pick up. Tov, beautiful. After a while that I spoke there, the owner of the organization, he has a rule. In the middle of the lecture, he does not allow people to come collect tzedakah in a shul. You want to collect, stand by the door when people come in or when they leave. But don't come inside and distract the people in the middle of the shul. Stand by the door. So he has a rule. Do not allow any collector to come in the middle of the lecture, which is perfectly right. You don't want to disturb Torah for that. Stand by the door, you get the same amount. One day, he comes in with a rabbi from Jerusalem, in the middle of my lecture. He comes whisper in my ear, I'm sorry, I'm going out of my normal uh, rules, but that's an emergency. Let me crack a room. This rabbi is already two weeks here in America. He did not even collect the, the airfare. He's very shy. Nebech, tzaddik, doesn't speak a word in English, doesn't have names of rich people. When I found out that he has 10 days to collect $20,000, unless if he doesn't collect, his yeshiva will be shut down in Jerusalem. I'm making an exception to the rule. Please speak to the audience about helping him out. Well, he did not know that few, about 20, 30 minutes before they enter, Hashem switched my mind. I was speaking about one topic and out of nowhere, I promise you, out of no connection, I started to speak about the importance of supporting Bnei Torah, people that sit and learn Torah, you, are, you have to be honored to support them and become a partner in their Torah. Best investment. How important it is, and I give them all the sources. And they are so inspired. And who walks in? Rabbi David Chitrit from Ramot. <laughs> now, he does, remember, he does not understand one word in English. All his life learned Torah. Then learn English in school. He stand by me. I begin to explain to them about the situation of his yeshiva. Call him. So Rabotai, as you know, we don't allow to collect your money in the middle of the lecture, but since it's such an emergency, we go out of the ordinary. 
Anyone who can help him to prevent his yeshiva from being shutting down, Hashem will never ever forgive, forget that, that you did such a thing. Now you know, from all the nationalities of the Jewish people, which one of them are the most generous, that have a very open heart, that they like to give tzedakah, and they mamash don't have yetzerara in this subject? Who? Beautiful. Georgian, the Gruzinim. The Gruzinim, you go, you find me now 5,000 Georgians from Georgia. You tell them we need to help somebody. There's not going to be one that did not put money and give tons of what he has. They have a much generous heart. They can't say no. no. Every other nationality, you have uh, stingy people, but you have generous people. Kulam, Parsi, Marukaim, Surim, Tripolita. You have good and bad, but by them, when it comes to help and tzedakah, <laughs> I never saw a cheap one yet. Never. So, Baruch Hashem Mazalo Shel Arav, there were a few Georgians there. And one of them just made a deal of his life. He bought a liquor from Paris and sold it for 60 million dollars after a year and a half that he was distributed in New York. Young guy, 32 years old made 60, mil 60 million, this was 20 something years ago. 60 million there was like 200 million today. So, I say anyone wants to help the rabbi? One, si one second of silence, 4,000, <laughs> 4,000. Remember, the rabbi has no idea what's going on. He's standing like a nebuch over there. The Georgian saw nobody say anything. He said, 4,000 for my parents. Extra. Nobody say anything. 4,000 for my sister and her husband. So 12,000. There was another Georgian next to him. This guy already hit three times. <laughs> this guy said, 4,000 for me and my wife. One Persian guy, 1,000. 360, 180, 500. 60 seconds, $20,000. 60 seconds. Why am I telling you this story? The half an hour that I spoke such words of encouragement and inspiration about supporting Torah melted their Yetzer Hara to the lowest. I have no doubt that when they went home that night, they couldn't fall asleep. What have we done? <laughs> but for the minute that the Torah killed the Yetzer Hara so good, just like the doctor gives you anesthesia, it takes away the pain for only an hour. But the pain is coming back. This anesthesia is Torah. That's the Torah. Or it's the antibiotic that reduces the infection and the pain. You stop with the antibiotic, immediately the Yetzirah grows back like the infection. You understand, Rabotai? So, here we see the power of the Torah. The, it reminds me about another joke. We'll finish maybe with this and I give some time for questions. One guy came to a place and he said to the rabbi, listen, I want to sell this mezuzah. I want to make an auction. Special mezuzah was written by special sofer. He's also a Kabbalist. I have to raise money. I'm poor. He said to him, believe me, it's not the place to sell it. Everybody here is, excuse my language, they're not so generous. Go to a place that people appreciate. No, no, I'm here already. Rabbi, please don't do this to me. So, Rakasha, I just warn you. Rabotai, we have special mezuzah. Please, uh, please be generous. One guy say, hi. <laughs> hi. You know how long it takes to write mezuzah? Three to four hours, if you experts so far. The cloth costs $15, $20. It's process, it's a letter from the cow. And you have to make the lines, it's a whole process. And then you have the person that does the tagim, a few dollars. The person that do aga, a few dollars. The computer check, a few dollars. Before you even started, you're between $30 to $40 cost. Four hours of work, let's say three hours. But sometimes it becomes pasul, they have to bury it. So if you add together all the time, four hours, let's say. How much uh, 
guy from Ecuador makes in a supermarket cutting boxes, $20 an hour. In New York, $20 an hour, right? So it's, it's not better than the sofer, Talmit Chacham, no? So four hours, $20 an hour, plus the cost almost $40 to get the cloth and the, and the checking. Right there, it has to be minimum 120. That's if it's nothing special. Now, if he has the best hand in the world, some sofrim, their hand is like printing. It's like my man should print. Then it can go up to a few hundred dollars for good mezuzah. It's a lot of work. So, one person said, hi. Another one said, 26. One says, pa'amayim hi, 36, 52. 72. Ah, we're getting there. One guy say 80, 85, 90. Then one guy say one dollar. <laughs> <laughs> it was all in pennies. He said to the rabbi, next time I would learn to listen to you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah, the stem rabbi. One of the things in life that we have to fix is generosity. There's a lot of bad midot, ego. Anger, laziness, selfishness, ungratefulness. Think about it. Generosity, stinginess, you know, so many things. Which one are the two worst midot that a person can have? The two worst ones. To the point that it's written that Hashem cannot stand that person. That's how bad it is. The, the world three. Ready? Gava, pride. Ego, arrogance. Everyone here is to bow down to me. That's the world. Then, anger. You know how angry people today? Do you know what's happening on the streets of Israel? Every day people get murdered on the road, stabbed. You cannot believe the anger of the people. You cut someone by mistake, or you don't drive fast enough, or you cut, and there's a lot of scooters in Israel, a lot of motorcycles. So they, they go in between the cars, sometimes you don't see them. It's hard to see them in a mirror. You're about to change lane, you hit them a little bit. What do they do? They take their helmet, helmet and they begin to hit you on the head and kill you on the highway. Few people got killed like this in the last month. They kill you with the helmet. They hit your head, one person went to coma. On the, uh, people crazy, the, ang the amount of anger. Do you know another place in the world that before the light becomes green, five people behind him already, bam! In Los Angeles? Because a lot of Israelis here. <laughs> But do you understand the anger? That's very bad. Where is your Munay in Hashem? What's going on over here? Anger and ungratefulness. Not every person is the same, you know. Some people, they are more weak in Akarata Tov. They don't appreciate. The more you do for them, the, the less they appreciate you. If people would have an appreciation, the world would look a complete different place. We have to learn from Gdole Israel appreciation. Rav Shach used to go every year to a cemetery in Israel with his assistant, tell him, wait here. He goes and read Tehillim by a grave of some woman. One time he went with him, it was pouring rain, wind, the umbrella is breaking, you know, those storms. But he did not stop, he read the Tehillim. On the way back, he asked him, Rabbi, why every year you come here? Who is this woman? She's your relative? He said, no. He said, 80 years ago, when I was in Europe, 80 years ago, 80 years ago, I was Bachor Yeshiva. I had only one white shirt. We didn't have money. We were very poor over there. So every once in a while, I have to go and do laundry. I go to the lake. So I did laundry and I was hiding for a few hours until the shirt will dry out. I don't want people to see me without a shirt. So I find myself a place hiding over there by the lake. 
And once the shirt get dry, I, I wear it, and I have it for another two, three months. One time this woman came. She saw me like this, with Gemara, and she said, young man, why you don't have a shirt? I just, I just did laundry, I'm waiting for it to dry out. Well, that's it, you have only one shirt? He said, yes. She went and got for him another white shirt. She had in the house, used one. Not, she didn't go to the store and order it. Something that she had, probably from her kids or, or whatever the case was. She gave him a shirt 80 years ago. From then on, every year he went to a grave to read the eliminary outside, this woman. Can you believe it or no? Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul was a ram in Yeshivat Porat Yosef. How much he make? Thousand dollars a month. That's, a, that's the salary back then. He asked for a tutor to learn with a boy and paid him from his little salary a big chunk of it. He asked him, who is this boy? Is your grandson? He said, no. His grandfather did a big favor to me. And I heard that he's weak in learning. So I'm returning a favor to the grandfather. This is a, the, the tzaddikim that they understood the importance of akaratatov. Today people don't appreciate. They don't appreciate. Whatever you give them. I remember of Wallerstein, Alava Shalom. He told the story a few months before he passed about a family in New York, in Brooklyn, that the girl became 18 and the rich parents bought her a Volvo SUV, brand new, for her 18th birthday. How many people in the world get a brand new car when they're 18? Not that many. Most kids when they're 18, they still take buses or trains. He said that when she saw that it's a Volvo, she got so angry, she refused to drive it. Why Volvo? Why Volvo? In Israel, Volvo is the car of the Prime Minister. <laughs> the Prime Minister get a Volvo. In Israel, there's a joke. Ah, you want to get a Volvo? Ah, you want to be a minister? <laughs> Over here, it's like car of the homeless, Volvo. So she's now angry and doesn't speak to her parents because they dare to buy her a Volvo. He went out of his mind when he was telling that story. Where did, how did we get to this? The answer is, when you raise kids without discipline and you give them and give them and give them, they will never appreciate anything in life. And also they will never be successful also in life. Because at one point, no one will serve them like the parents did. This is what's happening today. I tell parents, you raise your kids, each one of them like a prima donna. He thinks he's a prince or a princess. They have a maid. They never did laundry. They throw all the clothes, the towels on the floor. They never put things back. They never hang anything on a, on a hanger. They throw the coat. They throw the scarf. They... Now, once in their life, they did something in the house. Then one day you get them married, even if you buy them a house, let's say, you're very nice parents, you bought them a house. And even if you give them monthly allowance, whatever you do, which is what wealthy parents may do, but they are miserable because they don't live in the palace they grew up, I don't know, in Beverly Hills or anywhere else. And they now live in an apartment. And they don't have the maid live there non-stop and does everything for them. And they have to go to work. And they, they get mental breakdown. And I don't have to tell you how the marriage look. So I say to those parents, if you raise children like this, you must give them tons of money until the day they die. If not, you're a criminal. You cannot come and make a person a drug addict and then don't give him the, the drugs he makes that he's going to commit suicide. You did something. You have to be responsible for what you did. You cannot raise kids here in America like every one of them is some Saudi chef driving Ferrari when he's 20, having the life, wearing a $100,000 watch, and then one day you get him married and you leave him on his own. What is he going to do? Make $2,000 a week? He's going to commit suicide. That's why it's dangerous. You have to raise them from a very young age with cheshbon with discipline. 
that later on they will appreciate what they have. I had an uncle, we finished with this story. My uncle, Alaba Shalom, was a very wealthy man in Israel. Very wealthy. Worth a lot of money, had a lot of businesses. He was a very humble person. Baruch Hashem, the last two years of his life, I had the schut to make him Shomer Shabbat. He was a very tough cookie. He, was, he had very good midot, but he wasn't into religion. But Mamash, in the end, he became Shomer Shabbat, the last year or two of his life. But he raised my cousins as simple as I was raised. My father wasn't rich. So we, we grew up in apartment, you know, we're not, we're not rich. They were rich. They had businesses, he could have given them everything. He himself lived very modest, drove an old car. Their house was private, but nothing fancy. And my cousins, every vacation they had from school, went to work in his pizza shop, in the restaurant. He made them work just like the Arabs were working. I remember when I was a kid, I used to think, what kind of an uncle is this? He make his own sons work with the Arabs together in a pizza shop, preparing dough, taking the garbage out, forcing them to come early in the morning to work in, when we were on vacation. But every one of them became a hard-working person with discipline, serious, appreciate. They grew up big time, each one of them. Why? It, it just didn't give them. He prepared them for life. I remember other rich people in Israel. They used to send the rich kids from Tzfon Tel Aviv to be waiters. I asked, why do you have to be a waiter? Your father owns so many businesses here in Tel Aviv. Why? It's not about this. He wants me to earn my own money. Rabotai, Bezrat Hashem, I hope that this message that we spoke here about to conclude, remember, the Torah and the mitzvot bring lights to the neshama. Averot bring darkness, takes away the light. When you take away the light, the darkness overcoming the light. When darkness go in, you begin to have depression, anxiety attack, panic attack, sadness. It's called marash chora. Bitter and black. Everything dark in your life. Everything is bitter. How do you kick that darkness? A little bit of light kick away a lot of darkness. Spiritual light is Torah and mitzvot. Torah and irat shamayim and hard working on your midot. And what is the hardest for you to fix? That is your main purpose in life. Rabbi, I will do everything I not I cannot focus. That's your purpose. Rabbi, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do everything, but I cannot cover my head. I have nice hair, I can't put a uh, cover, I'm sorry. That's your main tikkun. Rabbi, I'm gonna do everything, but it's hard for me to give tzedakah. I give very little, I put a quarter every day in the shul. Hard, hard for me to give. I'm, what can I do? That's your tikkun. So what are you gonna do? Tomorrow you give a dollar. The next week you're gonna give dollar fifty. The next week two dollars, the next week three dollars, little by little. You increase, in, like in a gym. You start with two pounds, then three, five, seven, ten, twenty, fifty, until you become Schwarzenegger. <laughs> like this, you know? Everything in life is a practice and discipline. Devotion. Devo atmada, that's the word. Atmada. Atmada. The word tamid repeats a lot in the Torah. Tamid, 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 tamid. Tamid means atmada. Persistence. Persistence, right. That's the right way. Any questions before we finish? We have a Shabbaton here tomorrow. Yes. It's, the lectures will be here on the Shabbaton. So we're going to have filah here. And then we're going to go to two blocks away. We're going to have a beautiful dinner. And after the dinner, there'll be, the rabbi will speak. And then also Shabbat day. During the day we have Fila here, we're going to have Kiddush. And after the Kiddush, the rabbi is going to speak again. Fantastic, amazing. Okay, I just want to make one announcement. Please remember this website, www.storiestoinspire.org. There's a lot, there's more than 4,000 stories 
in 21 different categories who are inspiring the person very much. And from experience, I tell you, sometimes you hear a two-hour speech like tonight, and what got you the most is the two-minute story that I gave you about Rav Shach or Rav Ben Zion or, or the story about the tzedakah with the rabbi. That's what a person remembers in the end. The stories make a big impact. That's why when you learn the biography of those legendary rabbis and the miracles that happened, I, in my two books, the first one especially, Preparation for Eternal Life, there are dozens of stories over there that happened with me over the years that it's unbelievable miracles. There's no doubt whatsoever that Hashem came and made a miracle on that spot which is one to a billion. I made sure to put all these stories that happen inside the book. Sometimes people tell me, I read, I listen to everything, I learn a lot from the book, but you know what got me the most? The story with the barber. You know what really changed me? That's the, why the stories make a big impact, especially if you, you have young kids. It's very good for them to learn those stories, because stories teach about life. So Bezrat Hashem, don't forget www stories, stories plural, to inspire.org. Thank you very much. Baruch uh, Hashem, we'll be, in, we'll be in touch. On Sunday I speak by Rabbi Norola, and, uh, and I don't know exactly to tell you the address, but it's going to be on 8 p.m. Sunday. Bezrat Hashem. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hanania ben Akashia Omer. רצה הקדוש ברוך הוא לזכות את ישראל, לפיכך הרבה להם תורה ומצוות.